Welcome aboard, my friends. It's 1229 Eastern Time. Settling in for a wonderful Thursday here in North Fulton County, Georgia. It's a, a little bit on the warm side. Overcast it was a nice day, and I got Miss Bessie behind me. So hopefully you can see uh, Miss Bessie. Let me see. Thumbs up that you can hear, please. And let's see if anyone jumps on board here today. All right, so I'm going to start... Uh, yeah, look at this Bessie. Isn't she fantastic? I have to start. Instead of me going like this, I'll start uh, I'll start using her uh, as my maybe as my logo. How's that sound? So um, I'm hoping if uh, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can hear, that'd be great. Make sure that everybody's on board here. I'm, I got my smoked. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm smoking some uh, ground uh, chuck roast out there. And if you do it right, it tastes like a brisket, man. It is awesome. All right, so let me just go over here real quick just to see if there's any. All right, sweet. Mark, right on, man. Colorado, right on. Welcome aboard. Sweet, that's fantastic. So first thing I want to start with before we get cracking here is I'm going to talk to you guys about homestead exemptions, all right? Now, the reason I'm, I'm doing this one uh, this afternoon, because I'm not sure how many, well, from my man Mark in Colorado this morning, um, I like to range it around differently to see what uh, – a, how many people can show up on a certain day? B, how many people can show up at a certain time? And some people can show up on a Saturday afternoon. Some people can show up on a Wednesday night. I was going to do this last night, but I just got tired, to be honest with you. I told wife, so let me do it this afternoon and see how many people show up. It might be better. It might be worse. I don't know. But let's go into it. So, as always, ask your questions. All right. So, I was down there today at the uh, uh, Fulton County Assessor's Office uh, to get my homestead exemption. So if you live here in Fulton County, you've got to have it approved by April 1st. And what you got to do, what I'll tell you, a homestead exemption is a legal provision that helps reduce the amount of property taxes you pay on owner-occupied homes. Applications, this is again, Fulton County, Georgia, must be submitted on or before April 1st. I just looked at my, uh, I used to live in Fulton, Maricopa County in Arizona many, many, many moons ago, and you had to get that one in by March 1st. So if you're in Maricopa County, it's too late. I didn't look the total detail of the exemptions or not, so I'm not sure how many people's applicable to. to. It looked like it's income-based as well, but I, I either way, you have to have had it in there by March first if you're in maricopa county i was looking up kendall county in texas where i used to live i was going to look up um camden county new jersey because that's a bit actually i'll do that next time that's a big one in new jersey because the tax rates are so big there uh the home must be your legal residence for all purposes including the registration of vehicles and the filing of your georgia and uh federal returns uh all right. You're not eligible if you and or your spouse claim a homestead exemption in another city, county or state. So you're only eligible if you claim it here in Fulton County. If you are currently claiming a homestead exemption elsewhere, you must notify the appropriate authority to remove the exemption. Once granted, exemptions are automatically renewed each year as long as the homeowner continually occupies a property under the same ownership. Uh, in addition to basic homestead exemptions, there are additional exemptions from the Fulton County residents. So let me just give you an example here, guys. You know, I live in Fulton County, North Fulton County, which is probably, if not the one of the probably top three most affluent uh, towns in all the state of Georgia. I think there's one out by the. Uh, um, hey, right, right on Sergio, California. Um, I think there's a homestead. There's a, a more wealthy town out on the east side of, over by. The water out there, Tybee Island or something like that. But anyway, so we pay pretty significant property taxes. I mean, my goodness, we moved from New Jersey and I thought I was moving to the south. That was going to be wonderful. And it was because in New Jersey, our property taxes are 14000 bucks on a $410,000, $20,000 home, Cape Cod. Come down here, we got you know twice the size house with half the property tax. That sounds good. Uh, but it's a reverse sticker shock. Like, whoa, I'm only paying 7000 now. It's 8000 in property taxes. Whereas I was paying twice that, and I got twice the house on a uh, basically almost two times the size of the yard. I was like, that's freaking sweet. I'm telling you, man, you got to be, I, I'm just telling you, if you're coming from New Jersey or New York or someplace where property taxes are high, Texas or uh, New Hampshire, you just you be advised. Don't get reverse sticker shock because if you go literally that way, three miles, you're going to have half the property taxes. And property taxes are a big flipping deal when you're doing retirement planning. All right. So anyway, what you need for your homestead exemption, I'm sure it's going to file in any place. You need a, you need uh, your driver's license. You need to prove that you're resident. I had to bring 
the the uh, the registrations for all three of our vehicles. We got our 19 or 2010 uh, Honda Odyssey. We got our 2013 my car, the Toyota Highlander, both paid. And then we still are leasing for another six months, I think, something like that, on a 2018 Dodge Durango. And you had to show uh, all those licenses, uh, registrations in order to get it approved. So just if you're Fulton County, make sure you bring those with you. If you come now, I happen to be fortunate enough to have gone down there this morning. So I was able to, I didn't have those with me. So I was able to uh, uh, go down to my DMV, which is literally right next door. And they got me scored away real quickly. But that, you know, going to DMV, uh, my man, Thomas Major wonders if it's uh, in Maryland. What, what county are you in, Thomas? All right. So here's the, uh, I'm going to tell you what the basic Oh, yeah. Now, here's a basic home exemption. The basic exemption for Fulton County is thirty thousand bucks. All right. So they're going to take thirty thousand dollars off your assessed value. I think my assessed value is four hundred twenty thousand bucks. And remember, your assessed value and your praise value is St. I'm not familiar. St. Mary's. That's where the is that north. Is that right south of um of Gettysburg, right down that way? I forgot. But uh, anyway, so what 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 for us? Our assessed value is four twenty. The appraised value is much higher than that. Understand the difference between assessment and appraised. Uh, so, just, so the assessed value is what the county taxes you on, and that gives the uh, your county commissioner say, "Look, we're not we're not charging you too much. We we have a low assessment." Yeah, hell you do. You get a high millage. I think it's millage rates, mill rate, mill per. Th I can't remember. What it is. But anyway, there's a there's a name they use that to assess how much you're, you're going to owe, and it's uh, like a mill rate or a millage rate. And so if we're paying $8,000 on $420,000, that means I owe uh, 19%. No, no. Wait, what did I just do that for? 8,000 bucks on 20,000 bucks. I can't remember what I did on 420,000 bucks. Is that a point? What is that? It's a, uh, yeah, 2%, excuse me, 2%. I don't know what I was thinking, right? It's 4,000, 420,000 minus 2%. No, 420,000. Minus, oops, times two percent. Yeah, about two percent. So I was paying two percent. So basically, it's the two percent is what we're paying on property tax on the assessed value. All right. Now the appraised value. If I sold this for four hundred twenty thousand, I'd be in a world of hurt because my mortgage is higher than that. So anyway, that's so we're paying two percent. So now I reduced my four hundred twenty assessed value by thirty thousand dollars for our property tax. Now it's a three hundred ninety thousand dollars is my assessed value times that by two percent. And so now I just saved uh, $600 in taxes, essentially. Does that make sense? So I saved 600 bucks in property tax, uh, which is a pretty big deal, man. Uh, that's so Rick's saying 4%. Really? I don't think so. 200, uh, 420 times 0 0.02. Now I'm getting, I'm getting uh, 2%, Rick. Um, anyway, either way, so I'm saving 600 bucks in property taxes. I mean, that's 50 bucks. Yeah, 50 bucks a month. That's real money, my friends. I, real money. I wasn't doing it. And I've been here 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And this is the first year I'm doing it. So if you think about $600 and you know, times that by six years, that's almost $4,000 I missed out on. Now, that's my, my, <laughs> Rick, don't worry about it, man. I was like, hey, I didn't get it myself either. That's why I have my trusty calculator. Even that I was having a hard time. That's 600, uh, that's uh, almost 4,000 bucks I missed out on just because I didn't fill a stupid property exemption. Now, there's also $10,000 statewide school tax exemptions, which uh, to be eligible, you must be age 62. So if you're of age 62 here in Georgia, you might get another 10,000 bucks off. City of Atlanta has a $40,000 exemption. City of Atlanta has a $25,000 school exemption. I mean, it's just that the list goes on and on, the various exemptions. There's a freeze for senior citizens. And I don't know if you all saw my video I did on Texas uh, but you can actually defer your property taxes in the great state of Texas once I think you have to be 65 years or older uh, and never have to pay them. Now, they will be paid once you sell your home or your heirs inherit it. But either way, uh, once you are as long as you're living there, you don't have to pay your property tax. Here we're doing a freeze for senior citizens uh, to be eligible. You must meet the following requirements. 65 years or older. Uh, the applicants, and now is based on AGI. You cannot have AGI above 39,000 bucks. So AGI above 39,000 bucks. I mean, you think about it, that's if you're 60, uh, was a 65 and older, that means 39,000 plus 20. That's about, uh, $65,000 of taxable of a gross income. I mean, no AGI, I was AGI above 39,000 bucks. Yeah. Scratch that. 
All right, so AGI above 35, 39,000 bucks, you can have a pretty significant amount of money come from Social Security and certainly Roth IRAs and have another uh, $10,000 exemption on top of your property tax. Another reason to have just be to be careful on where your income comes because the minute you have $20,000 of IRA money add to whatever your Social Security, you're going to be above that $39,000 most likely. So if you had the more tax you have that's essentially hidden from the, the more income you have that's hidden from the government, the more likely you are to qualify. Here's another $54,000 Fulton County local school exemption. Must be 65 or older. Again, must have, uh, I mean, you're talking huge amounts of money here, my friends. The federal gross income from all sources of the applicant, spouse, and other persons residing in the home uh, cannot uh, be 30,000 bucks. 30,000 bucks is your AGI. I mean, that's your, remember, half of your social security, if not all of it, will not be in your AGI, depending on what other sources of income you have. And that's 54,000 bucks. So if you're a senior on a fixed income, you should have saw these two guys are sitting across from the waiting room here today. I was talking to him. One guy's kind of a little bit cocky. The other guy's just a regular dude. You know what I'm saying? And I could tell he wasn't living high in the hog. And I said, man, if you can write off uh, 54,000 bucks off your property tax assessment, I mean, that's real money. Uh, then he got an age 70 Fulton County full value exemption. I mean, all kinds of different exemptions. So the point about that is like my, my man in Southern Maryland uh, in St. Mary's County, uh, I would absolutely go online like right now. We'll wait till this is over. And I'd say, hey, can I file? Do I have a, a homestead exemption in St. Mary's County, Maryland? I would absolutely do that. Uh, do I have a homestead exemption in Maricopa County, Kendall County, Cumberland County, Maine, where I used to live, Camden County, New Jersey, Jefferson County, New York. Uh, I'm missing one. I forgot what else. Was. Oh, uh, Rockingham County, Virginia. Can I have, is there a homestead exemption in these various places? The city of Alexandria, Virginia, are there homestead exemptions? But I'm just telling you, it's a big deal, especially retired. So, all right. So I just want to talk about that. So go ahead. And if you have any questions on anything, fire them away. I had a question. Um, Jen asked on YouTube channel the other day, she goes, how can I determine from what accounts to pull from when I'm at my RMD? And by account, she meant her IR, like she has funds, like fund A, fund B, fund C, fund D. Uh, and she said, does she have to do them in the aggregate or can she just put them all in one fell swoop uh, or just choose which funds? And the answer is you can choose which funds you want. So you can say, look, I got my Wellesley fund and I got my Wellington fund, for example, and I'm going to take money from my Wellington and leave my Wellesley alone or whatever you want to do. So that's that's one of the things you can do when it comes to your IRAs. You can choose which account to, to take it from and at which fund, which invest is probably the better term. And you can't do that with a TSP through a savings plan. You can't. Uh, Jen worked with a, with a university, so she has uh, TIA CREP. I don't know how it works with TIA CREP. I imagine it's probably as is, is lenient as a regular 401k plan. I don't know that for sure. But certainly, certainly, certainly with a uh, – a four one uh, with a TSP, you can't. The TSP is all, it's just, it takes it out in one fell swoop, which boggles the mind, actually. I, I don't get that at all. So one of the reasons why you want to do roll your money from a 401k over to an IRA, it just gives you more control. But going back to Maryland with Thomas, don't do that if you live in Maryland, man. I'm telling you, because if you live in Maryland and you roll it from a 401k, if, if anyone's here on Rhode Island, same thing. If you do it in Maryland and you do it in Rhode Island, you're, you're paying more tax than you have to. Both Maryland and Rhode Island are very, very favorable uh, when it comes to tax treatment on 401k, TSP, 403b plans, not so much on IRAs. Uh, so just be advised. If you're living in Maryland, Thomas, and you retire there, you better know how the, the system works for rollovers. And if not, man, tell those people around you, say, don't roll over your 401k. Uh, even if you got some you know, slick uh, Merrill Lynch guy saying, oh, I can make you a million cent percent return on your money, man. Don't do it. I'm just telling you right now, you just look at the tax go to Maryland. I've done videos on that for both Rhode Island and Maryland. So just keep advised. Um, yeah, if you're 65, exactly. That's right. Right on. If you're 65, you don't have to pay the tax on it. That's right. Uh, but if you're 65 or if you're 50 and you're thinking you're going to you're going to stay in Maryland, you should not still pay uh, do the uh, rollover because you're going to at some point you're going to pay. Uh, Utah, I think if I if memory serves, anyone's here in Utah, memory serves, Utah was the exact opposite. Like it uh, had, um, if you have, if you have 401k, they weren't favorable to it in IRA. They were, I can't remember just in Utah it was a little bit different. So I did all 50 States in terms of what had weird tax things. I remember Utah had one that was, that was, is 
indifferent to an IRA, but is negative on 401ks if memory serves. Maryland and Rhode Island were very, very favorable to 401ks, employer sponsored plans. Uh, just, yeah, Thomas says better to convert if you have time, 100%. Someone asked another question I got. I said, hey, Josh, what if I, what if I'm, who was this guy? I forgot. I can't remember. But yeah, he just emailed me yesterday. If I'm 62, because he, I talk about the golden years of tax planning, 62 to 70. And he says, what if he's still working at 62? Uh, is it, is, can he not convert then? You can absolutely convert to Roth IRAs. Absolutely. The, the drawback, if you're doing that, though, is, is that you're still working with earned income and you're probably going to be in a higher tax bracket than if you were to wait until you hung up your boots, if that makes sense. So, you know, if you're making $50,000 a year and you're married filing jointly, you only get $24,000, whatever it is. I think it's 24 for this year of standard deduction. Uh, so you're still going to be in a 12% tax bracket right out the gate. Every $50,000 you convert is going to be taxed from the very beginning of 12% up to going higher and higher and higher uh, to 22% whatnot. Um, now, the 401k, uh, oh, is, is, yeah, so I'm just sitting there thinking, I'd rather you wait until you hit, uh, you're not earned income for sure. Uh, just not to add fuel to fire, so to speak. And that's just my preference, man. I, I don't think there's, it's a tough one there. I, if I know I'm making money and I know I'm going to be earning income for a while, I, I don't know if I'd add to it by converting uh, IRAs or 401ks to a Roth where I still have that income coming in. I, and I just, I don't know if I'd do that. <clears throat> now, it, but I got to tell you, I, because I, I worry about the widow's tax trap for sure, if I have a pretty significant 401k balance that will roll into an IRA, say it's you know, 500,000, two of 50, probably not so much, maybe. But the issues you got to contend with, if you're married filing jointly and you die, which you will, um, you're going to leave a pretty significant tax burden to your surviving spouse, depending on the size of the IRA you have. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm generally not favorable of paying more tax today if it's going to make me pay a higher tax bracket, even if I think I probably going to be in a lower tax bracket or a higher tax bracket in the future. I'm generally not favorable to doing that. So in this case, if I roll over 40, 50,000 to convert to an IRA, to a Roth IRA, and that 50,000 puts me in a 22% tax bracket. Uh, now, on the other hand, if I don't do it and I have to take RMDs, like my man just said, and that keeps me in a 22% tax bracket, I don't like converting it because it's a you know, bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. If that makes sense. If it's 22 and 22, and I'm pretty comfortable there's going to be 22 and 22, I'll wait till later on to pay that 22% tax bracket, if that makes sense. If it's 22 and 12, then I don't want to do that. No way. Now, but a lot of people get, they miss, they they don't understand how the tax code works when it comes to retirees. They think it's 12 as if it's just solely based on adjusted gross income. It's not. It's based on your social security, your taxes and retirement, because your RMDs will put your social security more at tax. I, there's just no debate about this. And anyone who says otherwise doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. I'm sorry. Your RMDs, required minimum distributions, will make your Social Security more subject to tax unless they're so low they don't have a provisional income. And I, I'm not going to get that. Maybe I will, actually. Let's just go over that real quick because it's, it's sync. All right. So I just I'm going to do this to a blue in the face. I don't care. Thirty thousand dollars of Social Security. All right. So that's what we've got. Thirty thousand dollars of Social Security. That's SS. I don't know if you all can see that. How we figure out provisional income, we got $20,000 of IRA income. All right, so you got $30,000 of Social Security, $20,000 of IRA income. All right, so we take half the Social Security would be $15,000. All right, and so now we're going to try to find, we got to find our provisional income to see how much of our Social Security is subject to taxation. And what we do is we take half the Social Security of $15,000, add the $20,000 IRA money, <clears throat> now our provisional income is $35,000. All right, so we're, we'll just say we're single this year. So now we have a provisional income of thirty of $35,000. Does that make sense? It's literally half of your Social Security plus any other income you have to include tax-exempt municipal bonds. And I, I, if you guys are bored from me saying this, I hate to say it, I don't care because it's so important. you got to get it in your head. And it takes a while, at least for my thick head. It took me a long, long time to figure this out. So I got 35000 is my provisional income. All we're trying to calculate is how much of that is subject to taxation. 
And then I think I had 30,000 of social security. So I'm just making mental note of that. All right. So 35,000 of my provisional income, the first 25,000, nothing is subject to tax. The next uh, 25 to 34 and then 34 plus. All right. So in this case, we got, so here's how it works. The first uh, 25,000 of this amount of money right here, none of your social security benefits are subject to taxation. The next 9,000, 25 to 34,000, 50% of that. So we know we're going to pay 4,500 because 34 minus 25 is $9,000. I didn't even need my calculator to figure that one out. Now, anything above that, which is going to leave us $1,000, we have 35,000, 25, zero. The next 9,000 is subject to 50%. The next amount above 35,000, above 34,000, which is 35, 1,000. Is times by 0.85, so 850 is going to be subject to taxation. Now I do need my trusty calculator. So we got our total Social Security taxation 5350. So $5,350 is subject to taxation of our Social Security. Does that make sense? So we made 30,000 Social Security, but 5,350 subject to taxation. Now we had $20,000 of IRA distributions. So we take the $20,000 of IRA distributions plus the 5,350 of taxable social security. That gives us 25,350 is our tax is our AGI. That's our Joe. What's up, man? That's our AGI 25,350. Now I've taught me that I can't remember the standard deduction to the penny. Let's just say it's 13,000. I can't remember 13,600 if we're married filing jointly. So we take our standard deduction we have $13,600 is our um, our uh, standard deduction, which is going to put us, uh, I still need my calculator, minus $13,600, uh, $11,750. Oops. It will be our taxable income. So in this case, for a married, a standard, uh, a single person, in this case, $11,750 is taxable. I think the first 9,500 is not subject to taxation or subject to 10% taxation. And then the next amount will be subject. So let's just say 9,500 is subject to 10%. And then uh, whatever that is, uh, 2,250 is subject to 12%. So we got, <clears throat> bear with me just a second, 9,950 and 2,250 times 0.12. That's 270. So in this case, we're paying, what's up, Rembert? Our, our Rob W. So in this case, we have two, uh, 950 plus 270 is taxes, is tax due. So for our federal taxation, it's going to be $1,240 on $30,000 of income uh, from Social Security plus uh, $20,000 of IRA. So we got 1240 taxes. Now, you want to see something funny. Let's do it the exact opposite. Let's do 20,000, ready, of Social Security. Yeah, right on. And my man Thomas says, add 12,000 years of Roth conversion. Could not agree more. And $30,000 of IRA. All right, so now we're flipping over. Before, we had $30,000 of Social Security and $20,000 of IRA. And that was our taxes right there, $1,240. Now we're going to have $20,000 of Social Security and $30,000 of IRA. You see, Miss, for all of you, that's Bessie right here. Isn't she awesome? I'm going to make that as my logo for my uh, my website, uh, YouTube channel. I love her. Um, she probably tastes pretty good on the grill, too, because I am a uh, – hey, West Tennessee, Kevin. Right on, man. Um because I am smoking. I'm looking right now and seeing that smoke, hickory, uh, mesquite, mesquite uh, smoke on my uh, mm, my gas grill. You turn the gas up a little bit just to get the charcoals embered. It's cheating a little bit, but, man, I can see that smoke, and it smells so good. Oh, you can smoke a chuck rose, and you slice it. It tastes like brisket. Oh, man, you just got to get seared. Anyway, all right, so now we're flipping this around. So remember what we do here. We take half our Social Security, which is $10,000 plus $30,000 of IRA income. So that makes our provisional income 40,000 bucks. I hope this is, makes sense and I hope you're following me. Um, $40,000 of provisional income. I kind of go, I don't really have any script when I do these live things. I just go with kind of what's interesting to me. And taxes are always interesting to me. All right, so remember we're a single person, zero to 25, nothing, 25 to 34, 50%, and then uh, anything above 34, 85%. All right. So we know 
We have 40,000 is our provisional income. The first uh, 25,000, nothing subject to taxation. The next 9,000, 50% of that is, so that's going to mean 4,500 will be subject to taxation. And then in this case, we have $40,000 of provisional income. The first, anything above 34,000, 85% of that subject to tax. Very confusing, huh? But I, I tell you, they do it deliberately, so you don't know what the hell you're doing. You just follow along. So now I don't, it's too confusing to pay attention to, but don't do that. Uh, 0.85, and that's uh, 5,100. All right, so in this case, $9,600. Our $9,600 of our $20,000 of Social Security is subject to taxation, almost 50%, whereas before I can't remember how much it was, but it wasn't 9,600, and we had more of Social Security. So 9,600 is now subject to taxation, all right? So that means of our taxable, when we figure out our AGIs, 9,600 is our Social Security plus $30,000 is our IRA money, which means 39,600 is our AGI. All right, so you with me so far. So 9,600 is our social security that's subject to taxation. 30,000 is from the IRA, which means our total AGI is 39,600. So take out 13,600 from um, standard deductions and now our total taxable income is uh, 26,000. And I'm just off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what the tax brackets are for a single person today, but I'm just going to say the first 9,900, what did I say, 23,600? No, I can't remember what I said. I say 23,600. I think I did. Uh, 20, yeah, I think I did. 23,600. I can't remember. But anyway, the first $9,000 is at 10%. And we're just going to say the rest is at 12%. I don't know that to be true, but I'm just going to say that 23,600. The whole point about this is to show you something. 14,600 at 12%. All right. So this is what the breakdown is. 23,600 is our taxable income. 9,000 is taxed at uh, 10%. 14,600 is at 12. So 14,600 was actually 9,500. Excuse me, what I did. 14,100. 9,500, 950, and 14,100 at 12, <clears throat> 16.92. So you want to see something different? It's going to freaking piss you off. Watch this. So now our taxes went up. Our total tax there is $2,642. 2642 More than double what we paid before. The exact same amount of income, but just more than double what we paid before simply because from where the income came. It comes from required distributions or any kind of distributions in IRA. It doesn't matter if it's RMD or not. It just matters if it's a distribution or if it comes from Social Security. You're, if, if you have more from Social Security and less from other things, you're, you have less taxes. So at the end of the day, the pe the people here, the lady, uh, the single uh, widow who is making 50000 bucks in income, she's paying Less in taxes if 30000 of that came from Social Security. She's paying more if 30000 of that came from IRA. And I, I'm just telling you, a lot of people don't get that. And it only gets worse as those IRMDs go up and up and up, subject more and more of your Social Security taxation, it becomes more and more painful. It's just nuts. And so that's the whole point. If you're retired and you're making about three to 5000 a month, I'm telling you, man, if you got a bulk coming from Social Security, you're going to be good. If you got a bulk coming from other things and minimal Social Security because you took it too early, you, you're not going to be. I mean, look, can you afford an extra 1300 bucks in taxes? Well, probably. Is it going to kill you? No. But when you're, I mean, that's what I tell people. I say, man, that's, a, you know, that's more than 100 bucks a month. What could you do with $100 a month? What could you do with that plus your homestead exemption that I just shared with you when I started this whole thing? Uh, so you save, I say $900, a, no, no, I say $600 a year on property tax because I filed the homestead exemption. Now I'm over 70 and I have, or 65 and I have a low income a homestead exemption too. So I'm saving another 1500 bucks. So because my income is low, I'm saving, let's just say $2,000. Plus I just saved another 11 to 1200 bucks a year in social security ta on income taxes to the feds. And if I live in Tennessee, it's not a big deal, but if I live in other States, it could well be. So now it's three thousand a, a year that I'm saving. You know, it could be. We'll just round up and say three hundred bucks a month. I'm saving in taxes. What can you do with that money? Well, hell, a lot of people that can be a life insurance thing for your long term care. I mean, I'm just telling you right now, you do a long term care policy. 
And with a life insurance component, it's 300 bucks a month. There you go. It could be a long-term care plan. It could be, I mean, so many things it could be. Investing. I mean, either way, it's your money. Ah. Uh, I thought I was a UT fan. And I was, nah, I'm, uh, uh, no, I'm not a UT fan. I don't really care that much that much. about. I, I like the Big Ten, Tony. Three yards in a cloud of dust. I can live with that in a cold weather on grass. That's kind of football I like, but we're, no, those days are gone. No way around that. Um, but anyway, so that's how it works. If you wait until file your Social Security, you take advantage of the tax laws. Like in Georgia, give you another example, $65,000 over the age of 64, uh, you pay no income tax if that's all you got. So the first 65000 bucks, you pay no income tax. If you're married, filing jointly, it's one thirty. No income tax here. You find you file all these property exemptions. Exemptions you I mean, you can reduce your property taxes significantly, and thus you can stay in the state. You don't have to move if you don't want, but you got to know the, how it works. But anyway, all right. Well, I, what else did I have? Other questions? Oh, so uh, a lady, a uh, Beth, emailed me about long term care. Um, actually, oh man, this is pretty interesting. So she had a a long. Let me just bring it up in my email here real quick. I thought I thought this. I was pretty much a fan of what she had emailed. I'd probably do a video on this, but let me see. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> so she says, "All right, bear me, all right, right there." She had a long-term care, um, long-term care life combo plan. If she drops twenty-two thousand dollars into it. Uh, she'll have a hundred thousand dollars of life insurance. She has a four percent. Um, uh, she can take as a accelerated death benefit at, for um, they call it something else. I'll sh share with in just a second. And seventy five thousand if she's terminally ill. All right. So four percent custodian care. That's what it's called. All right, so I want to share this with you. I, see, I'm, I like these kind of plans. I'm a big fan of them. So she has a long-term care life combo. She drops $22,000 in it. I hope that doesn't look like 66. It does on this end. Uh, she has $100,000 life insurance component. So if she dies, you know, her heirs get a tax free. The point, though, isn't to get the life insurance. The point is to have a long-term care provision there. In this case, she has 4% a month of what she, until her death benefit is exhausted. If her doctor says she can't do two of the six activities of daily living, transferring, that's a big one. I didn't know this until I had a good friend of mine who's dealing with her mom right now and getting up and transferring, moving, pivoting. That's a big one. And I, I'd never thought about that, but if you can't transfer pivot, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, but anyway, so the, that is a, uh, that's a big one. Obviously toileting, bathing, I can't remember all six. Uh, Sergio's on here. He might be able to pipe in. Uh, there's toileting, bathing, bathing, transferring, and three other ones. I just can't remember. But anyway, I don't know if it's dressing is one of them or not. So if a doc says she can't do that, she can then take 4% a month off that death benefit of $100,000. That's $4,000 a month um, off that death benefit. To, and that'll cover basically two years until it's exhausted, essentially. Now, if she exhausted, there will be no death benefit. Well, she doesn't care. I mean, she might care, but the point is, isn't the life insurance. The point is to have a benefit that way. If she needs it, it's there. And if she doesn't need it, at least the money, the 22000 she put in doesn't go to waste. And she always has, has access to, uh, I can't remember the, how the cash value component was. Probably the first couple of years, she didn't have any access to much. I think usually after year five or six, you have access to your full thing. It, each contract is different. If she's diagnosed with terminal illness and she only has a year to live, she can take $75,000 out of that contract. Um, so I'm a big fan of that stuff. Those are long-term care uh, life combos that uh, various companies offer. The, the drawback is you have to put some money in there. And so I always say, if you got some money, wait. that's pretty attractive to me drinking that. Sorry about that. I got to see my nasty abs apple going. But she has... If long-term care need, and she's like, uh, she was worried about she might not have a long-term care need, and she's paying all these monthly premiums, which is what Charlotte and I are doing. Where does that money go? She never needs it. Well, it's, it's literally gone. I mean, that that sucks, man. I mean, that sucks. That's you know, we're paying. I'll talk about how I can't remember how much you're paying. I don't remember. 
but let's just say Beth. So Miss Beth is, I think she said she's 59. So she's going to pay probably upwards of 300 bucks a month. Um, and she's not going to need a long-term care debilitating illness probably until she's in the late 70s, early 80s at the earliest, if at all. So she's going to have 20 years of paying 300 bucks a month for a policy. A, she's probably never, ever, ever going to need because we know only 5% of the population goes into a nursing home, some significant st stretch. And, and just a vast majority don't spend anything in nursing homes. The vast majority who do don't spend much. And then the ones who do spend a lot, that's, that's the outlier. That's the risk. Absolutely. It's like dying early. The likelihood of me getting killed early is minimal. But if I were to get killed, my wife would be doomed. Thus, I have life insurance to cover catastrophic risks, which is why the whole health insurance industry will never be fixed because it's not there for catastrophic risks anymore. It's there to basically cover you to get your equivalent of an oil change. It's stupid. It is what it is. But so life insurance, the life insurance long-term care combo, what I love about them is that you say at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to have 22,000. The opportunity cost is I don't have any growth on that. Sucks. All right. But the benefit is at least I know if I don't use a life insurance or a long-term care need, I am good to go because I will get that money back. My heirs will some, some capacity. If I do need a life insurance or long-term care uh, I thing, I have access to 4% a year of the death benefit. Now, that cover forty eight thousand dollars a year, and that's not adjusted for inflation. So forty eight thousand bucks in three, you know, probably she's eh, twenty five years, won't buy the equivalent of what it will today. And we know that factually for sure, just because of significant inflation on these nursing homes and long term care facilities and assist living facilities and whatnot. But it gives her something, absolutely something. So I'm a fan of that. Um, for the two bucket plan, says Greg, uh, should cash be in bank CDs or broker? Okay. Man, I'm glad you asked that, Greg. Uh, so that's actually, I mean, I, I got cut off when I was talking about brokered CDs. So let me uh, get my cheat sheet thing here again. All right, so broke, so CDs work. You put $100,000 in, you know you're going to get $100,000 at maturity. It's literally that simple. Oh, man, a beautiful cardinal out there. Ah, oh, man. Oh, that's gorgeous. It's just sitting there looking at me. All right. So you put a hundred thousand dollars in, you know, you'll get a hundred thousand dollars at maturity. Um, he's just staring right at me. That's crazy. It looks like the Arizona Cardinals football helmet. Um, if you were to break this CD before you're going to lose a good amount of, of uh, a portion, I shouldn't say a good amount, a good amount of the principal. All right. So, you know, you're going to not the, uh, your interest. All right. So you're going to get, is let's say you're getting 5% a year. That's $5,000 of interest you're getting each year. If you break the CD early, uh, you'll get your $100,000 back for sure, but you'll lose, uh, let's say, $2,500 of interest. You'll lose six months of interest typically. I hope that makes sense. But at least you know you're getting $100,000 back, but then you're going to lose $2,500 of interest. It depends on what your bank offers. A broker CD works differently. There is no surrender charge, none. And the reason for that is because the broker CD – Works like a bond. It could go up to one hundred five thousand. Could go down to ninety five thousand. I mean, they're literally being brokered, all right? So, broker CD you start with one hundred thousand dollars. There's no certificate. It traded just like a bond. And so, what I don't like about broker CDs is if you need to sell early, you have no idea what your what the price is going to be. And even worse, the person, usually the insurance company or pension company, on the buy side. Who's bidding? So you're asked. So what happens on any kind of transaction of stock or bond? It's a bid ask. I am I'm asking for a hundred thousand dollars. The guy on the, on the on the buy side says, "Hell, I'll bid eighty thousand bucks." And you're literally it's like selling a home. You're coming to a price point that says we can agree on something. All right. So that's how it works. And negotiating is what it is. You say I'm asking a hundred thousand bucks. The guy says I'll give you eighty thousand bucks, and you got to come to agreement. Now, the, the drawback is with bonds and CDs, I mean, I'm just telling you right now, and broker CDs, I mean, is that the, the buyers are a hell of a lot more attuned to the market than you are as an individual. And so there's some guy, my man Greg's just putting out a, an ask for 100,000 CD. The people on the, on the buy side, they, they, they know there's a reason you're trying to liquidate that. Thus, they have the they rule the roost because you are trying to liquidate this for a reason, and that means you are more prone to sell it for a discount 
then they're willing to pay a premium, if that makes sense. So the reason I like brokered CDs, because when you sell it, you have to get a bid. And if you're not getting any bids, I mean, A, there's no demand for it. And B, the only way to get a bid is to lower your, your ask, which means, again, it has no idea if it's going to come back in $100,000 or not. You just don't know. Now, it could be more. But what would make it go higher? Well, but the interest rates have dropped. And I just, what's the likelihood of that happening? I mean, right now, the 30-year treasury was, I saw it yesterday, was at 2.99. Uh, right now, the 10-year treasury is at uh, 2.632. That's TNX. That's a 10-year treasury. 2.632. That means it dropped three basis points from when we last spoke. At, it was at 2.625. I mean, so it's... That, the, <laughs> what's the likelihood that the rates are going to continue to drop down to where we were, I think it's 2015 when the 10 year broke 2% is below two. I mean, we're not in any kind of economic doldrums that would warrant that. Now it could have, look, I don't know. I mean, I'm reading about the solar, uh, solar flares and stuff like that, which is another reason I don't, I'm not a, I had, oh. <laughs> uh, some of you are going to be pissed off when I say this. I do not worry about climate change. I'm sorry. So I had a guy yell at me because I didn't think climate change was anything of, that, of worry. And he yelled at me on YouTube, called me a jerk and an idiot, blah, blah, blah. I just chuckle. Anytime someone has to refer to an ad hominem attacks, you know you are on the right side of the argument. So I just laughed. I said, okay, I've heard this. Look, man, many times a Sunday doesn't care. The minute that I know I'm in the right is when people got to start saying, you're an idiot, you're a jerk. The point is at the end of the day, anything could happen. Anything could happen. My goodness, we, we don't know. But the idea that we're in an economic doldrum that warrant the, the 10 year bond to go down below two or the three year bond to go down below two and three quarters, I, I don't see it happening. So the more likely event in brokered CDs is that the interest rates are actually go up, which means your $100,000 certificate is worth less because the same equivalent interest rate on a new issue that's being issued today is worth more because they if i let's just do it this way i'll show you what i'm talking about think about it i have two options i could buy a hundred thousand dollar cd or I mean, it doesn't even matter it's anything that's hundred thousand dollars one at four percent and one at three percent everything else being equal in this case they're both fdic insured which is more valuable well the one at a hundred thousand dollars is so if they're both if they're both issued at a hundred thousand dollars no one's going to buy this because they're going to buy that so what does that mean? That means the demand for this falls. And what happens when demand falls? Well, price falls. And that's what happens. And so that's that's how you have to look at bonds and CDs and any kind of fixed income asset is that if the interest rates go up, in this case, from 3 to 4% and everything else is equal, um, the thing that has a lower interest rate is, is not going to command the same price. So to answer your question, Greg, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm okay with broker CDs if I'm going to hold them to maturity, most likely. But just remember, there's a reason that you're going to sell it, and the guy on the buy side knows. He's saying, "Oh, uh, your, your liquidation, I'm going to sell you. I'll, I'll give you twenty cents a dollar, something like that." That's my that's my thought on broker CDs. And sorry, my thing got cut off when I was doing that video on it the other day. Um, uh, my man Rexpo, I'm considering a strategy. Uh, to address taking RMDs during a severe market downturn, I'm thinking to make sure that my IRA has enough non-stock assets uh, to take the RMD as, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you get, uh, I got no problem with that. I, you know, use it as part of the bucket for sure. I mean, it, you want to ride your winners anyway, Rex, bro. Uh, ride your winners, cut your losses. I mean, that's rule number one in investing. So if your winners are going and going and going, ideally, we wouldn't want to sell those to take RMDs. We want to take the things that are underperforming, which is one of the reasons why I am big on the S&P 500 and not so big on equal weighted indexes like uh, Dimensional Fund Advisors. Oh, what's the other firm? I'm drawing a blank. There's a firm out where in California. Oh, man, I can't believe I can't remember this. Or, and something analytics. Man, how could I not remember? These? Can't, no, it's not Cambridge Analytics. <laughs> Ah, I can't believe I can't remember that. Um, I got the, I can see the guy's face right in front of my face too. Uh, anyway, but they do uh, uh, equal weighted indexes uh, for sure. 
uh, and, and the benefit of the S&P 500 is because it's market cap is basically taking advantage of the momentum that the larger, uh, the, the, the things that make have done the best usually perform, outperform the things that have done the least best, if that makes sense. So because of the market weighted, the things that have done the best, they add their market caps. Their market caps are growing, the market caps are growing, the market caps are growing. Uh, which means that things that underperformed aren't aren't having as big of a an exposure to the index, if that makes sense. So, given what you're saying, yeah, man, keep some in cash as an RM. I mean, it's a hedge. You're saying, look, I got 75 percent of my assets in these stocks. I got 25 percent of my assets in safer stuff. Uh, if the market goes up, let that go and take it from my RMDs. The market. I mean, any way you want to skin that cat, it works for me. Absolutely. Yeah, my man Sergio says, what are my thoughts on uh, structured products? I've never been a big fan of them. Um, the structured products are what banks will use. Uh, Wells Fargo, Citigroup. And when I worked at Smith Barney, we had all these structured products uh, that were uh, <laughs> uh, that, man. All right. So you basically what they are is a FDIC. Most structured products I'm familiar with are FDIC insured. And what they do is they say, look, you give us 100000 bucks, We'll guarantee you at maturity you get your $100,000 back plus a certain amount of upside relative to an index. Uh, so if the index goes up 14, you'll get three. The index goes down 14, you'll go down nothing. If the index goes down 20, you'll go down 20. And so there's a lot of times there'll be some, and it's FDIC insured, uh, Garrett meaning is basically a certificate of deposit with an upside potential of the market to some degree. And so what happens is uh, they'll give you a, here's the mark goes up 100, down 100, and they'll say, Here's your here's your hundred dollars. We'll guarantee you that if the market goes up a hundred, we'll give you twenty percent of that. If that makes sense, the market. Goes, so you got a hundred. Market goes up a hundred. We'll guarantee uh, we, you won't get a hundred. You get twenty. You know like, that's pretty good. A lot of the ones I used to dabble with though, they'd say, look, if the market goes down twenty. So in this case, the you have you have a hundred dollar issue. The market goes up 100, you get 20% of the gain or whatever it is. I mean, I, whatever it is. It's not dividends, by the way. It's just price to price. And if you follow the YouTube channel, you know how much I despise price to price or what's called point to point because it takes away dividends and dividends are such a significant representative of the returns of the market. Uh, that's where that's where you get skunked. Anyway, so you got 100 bucks. It matures on 100 bucks. If it goes up to 100, you get 20% of that. So you're getting 120% on your $100. Not too shabby, you're saying to yourself. Man, I had FDIC guaranteed uh, principal protection. But a lot of the ones that I dabbled in, as long as the market does not go below 20%, we will guarantee you uh, your return of principal. Now, if it goes below 20%, you're going to take some of that loss, if not the whole thing, if that makes sense. And so basically what they're saying is we'll protect you against a relatively common uh, bear market or correction, but we're not going to protect you against a significant correction, bunny stretch. And so, uh, see, that's what I don't like because the whole point is, you know, if, if, if you're afraid of a 20% market decline and you need that in order to do this, I, that's not the, the the big risk is a significant market decline, uh, you know, 55 percent from 2007 to 2009. I mean, this would not have protected you in that. Now, the, every single structured product is different. Every single one. There's some that offer much more um, upside uh, with more downside. Some are some aren't FDIC insured. The, what I found, though, is a lot of, is, is a wonderful way for a guy to make commissions. And look, man. I'm the farthest thing from faulting people for making commissions. I am of the opinion I'd much rather have you pay commissions to some guy, Ed Jones, to put you in A shares American funds than I would have you pay some guy 1% a year to put you in index funds. Uh, the commission account will do better, I can almost assure you, uh, than the 1% a year would account. And the simple reason for that is because you're going to pay less fees. There's no two ways around that. And I don't care if this guy is doing a fee bait fee account. He's you know a registered investment advisory. He's a fiduciary. He's as pure as wind driven snow. If he's charging you 1% a year on an asset base that's growing, and now on the other hand, you went to some guy, Ed Jones, who might not seem like he knows his you know, butt from a hole in the ground, uh, but he only charged you 3.5% up front. And on the asset base is growing without that, that headwind, that guy's going to outperform. There's, no, there's just no two ways around that. 
And so anyway, I'm, I'm not against commission-based products at all. What I don't like about structured products, though, Sergio, is that it's almost like an annuity. They roll them and they roll them and they roll them and say, hey, Mrs. Smith, this structured product's matured. You give us 100, it's now worth 102. Let's do it again. She goes, okay. And every year they get 3% of that. And I just, it's hard to make any money if you're paying 3% each and every year for these structured products. It is. I mean, I just, so I'm not a big fan generally. Um, you had asked about three and five year ones. Yeah, I'm not that familiar. There was one I, was, I did a video on. I forgot what it was. Uh, but the same thing, priced a point to point. They had called it something. And someone actually emailed me on the YouTube channel, put a note on the YouTube channel about that similar product. Bullet shares is what it was. Bullet shares. And I, I didn't like that. So I did a little bit of research. I did a video on it. Um, and just not a fan of it for sure. But, you know, I can easily be convinced that there's more to the meets the eye. It's been you know, going on 15 years now since I was doing these things, that's for sure. Uh, can you explain what a home's... Oh, yeah. So, Jeff, yeah, right on, man. I saw you... Uh, don't feel bad. I can't remember anything either. <laughs> Someone was telling me, I was reading that if you take turmeric, and I started to take turmeric for anti inflammation in your shoulder, uh, that is good for Alzheimer's, FYI. It's good for cogn brain cognitive cognition or whatever it is. So, I am taking turmeric. It will tear you up, though. Just be advised. It's like it's like um, Indian food with a curry. And I, oh, I can't stand curry, but man, it, I tell you, I feel since I've been taking it, my pain in my shoulder has gone away quite a bit. And I started doing this uh, thing where you just stretch like this, and man, it, it feels great. Uh, so homestead exemption. All right. So just uh, Jeff uh, to revisit that is a homestead exemption is a way you can reduce your assessed value on your home if your county allows it. And so what I talked about here at the beginning of this show, as I said, I can reduce the property value of my assessment by thirty thousand dollars here in Fulton County, Cal uh, Fulton County, California, Georgia, which is saving me approximately six hundred dollars in property taxes. Ain't too bad. Uh, and because what they do is well, I use an example. If I'm at a four hundred twenty thousand assessment and I get a thirty thousand dollar homestead exemption, my assessment now is uh, three ninety and I was paying two percent on my value, my assessed value uh, to the great folks in Fulton County, Georgia. So now I'm paying two percent on three ninety as opposed to two percent on four twenty by just filling out this one. I don't have it there. I, I went down to the office today. This one piece of paper that validated that I I do own this property. I had to swear and I had to raise my hand, and then I had to say that it is owner occupied. And because I I'll get uh, thirty thousand dollars reduced off my property as tax assessment. Every county has their own unique ones, um, and so. Uh, we and I think my town actually has another ten thousand dollar one here too, and I know Alfreda does as well. So your town might have a homestead exemption on top of your county. I, I'm telling you, man, I I would highly recommend you look at you know your county there in North Carolina and see if they offer it because it could be a big deal. I did look at Maricopa County, uh, Phoenix, um, in Arizona, and they have it seems like everybody gets a homestead exemption of one fifty, hundred fifty thousand dollars. They did have more for seniors and those with low income. Again, goes back to the idea, we want you to look as poor as you possibly can on paper, and that way you don't have to pay more in taxes, and you can get various things, exemptions, Obamacare, uh, with the credits, whatnot, all that stuff. The poorer you can look on paper, my friends, especially in retirement, the better off you're going to be, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Don't feel okay. Thank you. Is it worth converting my 401k uh, to a Roth to avoid paying tax my Social Security? Yeah. Absolutely. So Stephen says, is it worth converting my 401k to a Roth to avoid paying tax on my Social Security income and Medicare premiums in the long run? Or would I be money ahead not converting? I, I, I mean, I, so someone asked about uh, uh, IRMAs as well. The uh, I forgot what that stands for, but it's the increase in Medicare premiums. Income Related Medicare Adjustment Act, IRMA. Uh, and so what happens here, guys, is that if, if you hit a certain threshold of your income and initially it was not indexed for inflation, right? Just FYI. And now it is indexed for inflation because of new tax law. So one one check for the Trumpster right there. But initially it was not. But anyway, so it's indexed for inflation now. So this year it will be different than what was last year. But essentially last year, if you're single and you had seventy eight thousand dollars of modified adjusted gross income, we'll just say eighty thousand for simplicity of eighty thousand dollars in modified just gross income, your Medicare premiums were in increased uh, in that case by 35%. That's part B and part D. Uh, that's a big deal. 
And now if your income went above, I think it's 105, it doubled. If it went above 115, again, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but it wasn't, uh, it was a pretty uh, low burden to jump. Once you hit 80, it wasn't much to get to you know, doubling, tripling, and quadrupling of your Medicare premiums. That's, that's before you factor in your standard deductions. It's literally your gross income, which also happens to include your tax-exempt interest, by the way. So like my man Alberto, and I don't think he's on here today, but he's got 5% municipal bonds, which is freaking wonderful. And he bought them at discount because he's smart to have cash on the side. And he bought them during a 2009 where you couldn't freaking give away a municipal bond. So he did. I mean, that was a wonderful, wonderful move. Those days are long gone now. So to buy municipal bonds in order to reduce your taxes uh, doesn't make any sense because the municipal bond interest is, is factored in your Medicare premiums and it's factored in your tax on Social Security. Don't do that. And so anyway, going back to your question, Steve, is it worth it to convert? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the drawback is always if you're in a convert and it puts you in a 22% tax bracket, in a 12% tax bracket today, and you convert and it puts you in a 22% tax bracket today, and you're pretty comfortable that in retirement, you'll still remain in a 10 to 12% tax bracket. Um, it probably doesn't make sense. But what people miss is, is not just Stephen and Mrs. Stephen. It's Mrs. Stephen as well. What happens to her when you die? That's what always gets overlooked. I, for the love of me, man, people say, well, I did my Excel spreadsheets and it shows you I'm 1%. In the future, I'll be in a 10%. So I don't need to convert. I said, what happens when you die? If you're married, filing joint, what happens? And they're like, uh, what do you mean? And I, I'm telling you, man, no one knows. I mean, I don't say no one knows, but a lot of people overlook the fact that if you are a single taxpayer, you owe more than if you're married, filing jointly. You get a higher exemption, the standard deductions, and your tax brackets as a married, filing jointly. Not only you get the two deductions, but you get a higher tax brackets too. So, it's, I mean, so you can't just look at 12 now for Stephen and Miss Stephen. And think it's going to be 12 later for Stephen and Miss Stephen. You got to look at 12 now. What's it going to be later when you die and leave your assets to your surviving spouse? And that's a big deal. So that way makes it to me, I think you will be in a higher tax bracket. If not you, then your spouse for sure, which is what makes it worthwhile to convert. Now, should you convert if it's you know 10 to 12, fine. But if it's 12 to 22, that's a 60% increase in taxable a brackets there. It's going from 12 to 22 is a 60% increase. Is it worth it? I don't know, man. That's a tough one there. That's a tough one. I, I it, it's, Situation dictates for sure. Uh, Tracy G, what's my thoughts on reducing life insurance coverage as you get older and your portfolio gets larger? Uh, if either of us passes, we yeah, well, no kids. Okay. When well, you say no kids at home, Tracy, does that mean no kids? Um, What's the best asset your heirs can inherit? The best asset your heirs can inherit. All right. You got three assets. We'll do four assets. We got a taxable account, a tax deferred, tax free, which is the Roth, and then life insurance. All right. So the of the four assets, the best one they should inherit is this guy right here. And this guy right here is probably 5149. The worst asset and the second worst asset. The tax deferred is your IRA 401k. The reason for that is because life insurance is 100% tax free. All right. There's no required minimum distributions, 100% tax free. It's liquid at the day they get it. There's no fuss or muss on how much it's going to be. With a Roth IRA, while it's 100% tax free, and the growth is also 100% tax free when your kids inherit it, which the growth on life insurance is not, which is a big deal. Uh, but there are some limitations. What if the market is down 20%? What if the market, uh, I mean, what I mean, I could a, a myriad of things with inheriting a Roth IRA, which makes a little bit less, uh, I hate to even say, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it's probably 50 50. Life insurance is good because it's 100% tax free. They know exactly what it's going to be. Uh, no liquidation needed. They just know exactly what it's going to be. Roth IRA, uh, is good in that they can inherit it and stretch it out over their life expectancies, still take it tax-free. They do have RMDs, but the required distributions are still tax-free too. The drawback by the Roth, and this is the same thing with the life insurance, is once they own it, uh, it is subject to creditors. All right, So creditors and predators, 
creditors and in-laws and outlaws. That's what we say in the estate planning realm. Uh, creditors have access to inherited IRAs, 100%. Creditors, act, predators do too. Like you're leaving it to some naive son and he gets uh, blown away by some guy who promises in the world to uh, you know go to the University of Southern California to pretend like he's a uh, does rowing or tennis at Georgetown or whatever it is that controversy and he said yeah that's I want to be and so that's a predator in-laws and outlaws <laughs> man they come out of the woodwork the minute you start finding out they got you got money man they're like white on right so anyway neither of those things are exempt from that let's just put it that way but I'd much rather have life insurance inherited than the other two so if you don't have a significant Roth built up and you said you have a significant you have a pretty good 401k um I'm hesitant to say get rid of life insurance um I don't know. It depends on the premiums. Uh, if it's term, yes. If it's term policy, it's going to be way too expensive. If it's a universal life and you have some significant cash value in there, I'd be hesitant about cashing out. If it's term, I, it's going to be too expensive because uh, once the term matures, i.e. you got a 20 or 30 year term, and now you're in year 21 or 31, the, the price on those is just going to go through the roof. At that point, it becomes an annual renewable, which means it becomes more and more expensive the older you get. The closer to death means it can be even more expensive because the older you get, the closer you are to dying, the closer you are to dying, the more the insurance company is going to charge you. So annual renewable term, we used to call them ARDIs. Yeah, you don't want that as you get older. And any term policy that's issued today, uh, that's what it becomes. It becomes an ART, an ARDI, annual renewable term. And I, I just don't see any value there at all. Unless, you know, you took up smoking two packs of cools and you're going to die from heart uh, lung cancer tomorrow, then maybe you should have that. I'm hesitant to say get rid of it outright uh, just because I do like life insurance as part of the situation. Just remember, guys, on the on the four buckets here, the the best, the next best one after life insurance and Roth are 50-50 is your taxable account because they get it with a step up in basis. And just to elaborate on this, and some of you guys will probably get bored because I talk about it so much. Oops. You put $50,000 in Apple stock. It's worth $250,000 at the day you die. Uh, that 250, that $200,000 of gain. So you put 50,000 in, it's worth 250. That $200,000 gain transfers to your heirs completely tax free as long as it's not in an IRA. So they get it completely tax free. If you live in a common law state, California, most of the states out west, Texas, I think Texas is common law too. Man, I used to know the states off like. I could, could recite those to you. I think Texas is common law. If anyone here is in Texas, they can speak to that. Um, uh, it transfers to your surviving spouse tax-free as well because of step-up basis and community property, whereas in uh, us in common law states, uh, community property states. So did I say that? I forgot. Anyway, community property is Texas, California, Idaho. I can't remember if Utah is, Wyoming. Those states out west are community. We are in common law here in Georgia and the Northeast and whatnot. So at my death, if I own $25,000, $50,000 of Apple, it's worth two hundred fifty. dollars my wife would inherit it. Half that would be tax-free because of step-up basis, but the other half, if she were to sell, would be subject to capital gain. If she lived in a community property state, California, Texas, and the other ones out west, uh, she'd get the whole thing tax-free. So that's a big deal. Don't I'm telling you, man, don't overlook the value of taxable, i.e. brokerage accounts, especially when it comes to estate planning. They're a wonderful, wonderful asset to have. And a lot of people have no clue. They don't. They say, I'd rather shelter myself from you know 10% tax, 12% tax today uh, because it's what everyone tells me to do. And I said, no, man. If it, I mean, just, it doesn't make sense. There's way too many better, more beneficial ways to deal with the tax, man, than just you know taking a couple hundred bucks off your taxes today, especially when you factor in things like step up and basis. It's nuts. Uh, let's see, just changed my YouTube name. Wondering if it worked. Still says Tom Major. Thomas was too formal for me. Yep, Tom Major. Speaking of the USC mess, did you think they'll get any jail time? Pfft, come on, Tom. <laughs> These are the elite. Actually, some of you might not like it, but there's a guy named Ben Shapiro out there. He talked about while well, he was in Harvard Law School, how they said that basically it was Elena Kagan who is now on the Supreme Court, said, hey, you made it. Don't worry. Now you're the elite of the elite. You'll be taken care of. I said, this is the problem with higher education. Once you get in, you're in. But no one cares what you do afterwards. It's nuts, man. 
That's why you should go to State U or better yet, community college or better yet, don't go at all. It's nuts. So you get into Harvard Law School because you were able to put your face on like you're rowing and then your, your rich mom donated all kinds of money to the freaking university. You're in that school and now you don't have to do anything. It's nuts. It's, that's not the way America is. America is the best shine. The lazy don't shine. Doesn't mean we leave the lazy to you know, freaking die on the vine. But, you know, I hate to say it, but if you're a hardworking guy and lady, you should get rewarded as such. If you're just sitting there on the on your parents' laurels, what the hell? And I, look, I get it. Whatever forever happened in humanity, but eh, I don't like it. But no one's going to jail, man. Come on. They're not Paul Manafort. <laughs> it's nuts. Look, I got no, man, that guy, he seems like a scoundrel too. I'm not going to lie to you. I get all these guys in D.C. That's why it's a swamp. All these guys, right, left, everyone. They're all swamp critters. They're all swamps. They're all swamp. It just drives me crazy. John Boehner. So look at Bob Livingston. Ay, ay, ay. All these guys. These are Republicans now. Bob Livingston, when Newt Gingrich stepped down as a House Majority Leader, a Speaker of the House, this guy from Louisiana, Bob Livingston, came in and took over. Now there's this Livingston group in D.C. that uh, some scoundrels are part of on the right, I think. And I said, hey, man, all these guys, man, all they're doing is they're selling influence. It's nuts. And then uh, John Boehner, all of a sudden out of nowhere, Boehner, who was against legalization of anything, even though he smoked like a chimney. And I was like, hell, marijuana is better for you than your freaking cigarettes, dude. What the hell? And now all of a sudden he's the biggest pro pot guy in the world. Why? Because they paid him. That was just going feet. Hey, who else? I mean, I guarantee if I paid Banner more to say be anti pot, he'd be anti pot. It's freaking uh, prostitution, man. And they're going to go after these ladies in DC on 14th Street. When I was growing up in DC, 14th Street is where all the prostitutes hang out. They're going to go after them, but yet John Banner can prostitute himself. And yet some lady is prostituting herself for money. She's going to go to jail. That's freaking wrong. It uh, drives me insane. Ugh. Ugh. All right, uh, Josh, enjoyed your video on Preferred Stock. I have to admit, I really don't know what it was. Can air roll over a parent's IRA to their own? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Oh, 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 stop. That's an inherited IRA. Excuse me. Okay, so my man Joe, inherited IRA. Yes, you can roll it to an inherited IRA. It's, it's, you be careful with the terminology there, though. You don't want to say rolling it over. I guess it, I don't know how you'd call that, the actual action, but it, it won't be into Joe uh, Michaels IRA like it would be if Jane Michaels, your beautiful, beautiful, died and left you with your money with her IRA. You would roll that to your own IRA. Absolutely. Situation dictates. I'll get to it in just a second. That is rolling over to your own. You're taking Jane's to yours. Now, Joe owns it. You, you own it as if you know, I'd say Jane wasn't around. If Mr. and Mrs. Michaels leave you their IRA, you can't roll that to your own. It's going to be an inherited IRA, which means you have required minimum distributions, and that is now subject to creditors. Let me be very, very clear in the Supreme Court in 2014, which, uh, what's her name, uh, Sotomayor wrote the, the, the decision, unanimous, Clarence Thomas, Scalia, Sotomayor, and all the crazy on the left. They all agreed inherited IRAs are subject to creditors. They are no longer protected from lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. Just be advised. So if you have an inherited IRA, uh, you just got to be careful because that would be subject to lawsuits for sure. Uh, leaving inheritance isn't priority, probably 25% whole life, uh, 75% term. Yeah, to keep the whole life, uh, Tracy, and, and let the term go. I got no problem with that at all. I, I, look, I like whole life for the most part. I mean, I have... Eight whole life policies, two each on my four kids at fifty thousand bucks a pop. It's you know, it's not gonna I, I do not like these sales pitches these guys from Mass Mutual and other firms use on whole life. I'll tell you that right now. Trust me, and I have <laughs> a few very close friends of mine, and they get pissed when I tell them about how much I don't like it. Oh, they get mad. Man, I'm telling you right now, I'm not a fan of looking at whole life as a way to have tax-free income when you retire. You just give us $25,000 was it ten thousand for the next 15 years, and we'll give you $22,500 for the rest of your life tax-free. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Uh, prefer stock. Rob, okay. Um, uh, I don't know how to answer the, the, the comment about what preferred stocks are. Um, yeah, I don't know if I want to get into that here today. I'll do some other ones on that. I am going to do one on a uh, on difference on on CDs 
uh, with bonds in terms of uh, how they work. Because some guys said, I'm a visual learner, probably with dyslexia. Can you do it on the whiteboard? I'm going to do another one on that today. Uh, I said, okay. It's still, it was a few minutes ago, Tom. Is it still buffering now? It was for a few seconds. I see people dropping off, so it might be right now. All right. Well, I guess after an hour, YouTube gets on me. So they're saying, uh, yeah, people are falling off. So we we'll throw their own grandmother on the bus again. Yeah, right on, Big A. Right on. All right, my friends. So it looks like we might be buffering. I can see the uh, the people dropping off. So that's always a sign to uh, get out of here. But uh, appreciate you being on here. Like I said, uh, I'm always interested in what's the most convenient time for this. Uh, I like doing it. And it's uh, fun. It's actually YouTube likes it too uh, when I do it. So the algorithm is my master. I, I, I hear to the algorithm. So if you would smash, because when you see the smashes, the algorithm says it pricks up and say, hey, that guy. OK, it looks like we're back. Um, anyway, so smash. And of course, always comments are always welcome. And uh Anything y'all have questions, thoughts, concerns, put in the comments, and uh, we'll see you next time. Got a couple videos I'm going to do today. One on a long-term care uh, partnership program. A guy from South Carolina told me about the long-term care partnership program at South Carolina. I haven't done that yet on a YouTube video. I'll do more on preferred stocks uh, from my man, Rob W., because uh, I do have some, actually, I don't think y'all can see them, but I do have some links up here for more on preferred stocks I want to do. Long-term care partnership program is one I want to do too. And then I'm going to do a case study, as a matter of fact. I haven't done a case study for a while, so I'm going to do another couple more case studies. Um, this will be a single taxpayer, 59 years old, and, uh, and and that will be interesting. So we'll do all that as well. All right. Am I, are you pumping iron today? No, I'm, I'm uh, Mark, I'm going to go for a walk. Actually, it might sprint. Uh, we have a... A uh, nice little, uh, well, you can't see where I'm pointing at. We have a nice little area, not a mile from here, which I will probably walk to and then sprint and then walk back. Uh, sprinting, uh, man, sprinting it kills me, but I love it when I'm done. I hate it when I'm doing it. Kind of like squats. I hate squats, but they feel great when you're done. But when you do it, you just really want to kill yourself. I uh, did a great series on developing four funds as a portfolio retirement. Have a fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, let me do that. So my man Dave uh, talks about redoing that video on uh, four funds as a portfolio in retirement. Uh, how performs? You were going to do a follow-up to use cash and the down. Yeah. Okay. No, right on, Dan. I'll uh, need to get back on that too. I literally have a, an Excel spreadsheet of a vast amount of content that I've been wanting to do. I just get caught up in my research for my book. And so now that I kind of have that I don't want to say behind me because I'm ready to start my book, um, writing it with my research done. I'm going to get on that too. I, I'll never do a marathon, Mark. <laughs> Ain't never going to happen, man. For those who want to do it, more power to you. I'm not doing it. My legs are too sh short and squat. I'm only 5'9", and I got short squat legs. My wife is 5'7", but she's like, you know, I, I have – her legs like this, mine are like this, and then my upper body is like this. Wait, what is it? My upper body. I can't remember how it is. She's slim and slender because her parents are both six feet and above, which is weird. My mom was five four, five two. My dad was six two, I think, or is six two. And everybody in my family is six one as men and above. But my mom was so small and my Grammy. So I think I got the combination of my mom's height. Uh, with uh, with short squat legs, which is kind of weird. Where my wife has slend, you know, long and slender like her parents, which is kind of funny. So, our kids got you know some of the best of, of the both worlds, I guess, and some of the worst of both worlds, if you will. See you guys next time. Thanks now.